Good morning and welcome to the Ubiquiti PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. I would now like to hand you over to CEO Nick Waters. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Alex, and thank you. And good morning to everybody who's joining this call. This is the annual results presentation for the year ended December 22 for Ubiquity PLC. My name is Nick Waters. I'm joined today by our CFO, Alan Newman. <clears throat> um, we have approximately 40 minutes worth of content and then we'll obviously be happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, just to start, you may have seen the announcement that uh, Alan will be retiring at the end of June. So I just want to uh, put on record my uh, thanks to Alan for everything he's done for the company over the last four years since he joined um, and the fantastic contribution he's made and, and support to myself and the rest of the wider Ubiquity leadership team. So thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I will start with a um, quick uh, summary, um, uh, executive summary, which I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to report we can um, talk about positive results and positive momentum through the year. Um, you'll have seen we delivered uh, very strong revenue growth of 20%, including 9% organic revenue growth and a significant improvement in the operating margin and uh, total operating profit. We made three acquisitions during the course of 22, one that I would describe as a, a relatively small tactical one and two strategic acquisitions. Um, and I'm pleased to be able to tell you that all three of them have been integrated well and contributing well to our results and our business. Uh, also pleasing was a strong uh, geographically distributed performance, all regions uh, growing strongly, all regions performing well. We've also, as you know, made quite a concerted effort over the last couple of years to develop our digital media solutions. They continue to deliver high revenue growth and at a high margin. Our largest uh, service line is media performance, um, and that has been our strongest growing service line. Uh, it has been boosted significantly by the acquisitions that were uh, primarily focused in that media performance service line and by our digital media solutions. Our contract compliance service line has had a particularly good year, being our fastest growing service line organically. Now, that is coming off uh, a couple of years where it struggled a little bit. It was the one most badly hit by the COVID pandemic because of the nature of the work where the teams actually go and sit in agencies' offices to conduct their audits. And of course, offices were closed. So 2020 was a very, very difficult year for that particular service line. Started to recover in 21, but it's really found its feet and, and gained momentum in 22. As we sit here now, um, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that I feel the outlook looks encouraging. I will now pass to Alan to go through the numbers and I'll come back and uh, give you an update on the strategic progress. I am. Thank you, Nick. Um, we'll start with the uh, summary of the income statement. Um, I'm going to just give you the highlights. Uh, as Nick mentioned, we had 20% uh, revenue growth, uh, including benefit the acquisitions in 22 and 9% organic growth. So um, you see that the acquisitions contributed 11% in their uh, seven to eight months they were in. Um, if you take the 9% the organic, that in it can also be divided roughly equally between the digital media solutions growth and the rest of the business. And um, one of the points to make, which uh, people have asked us already is <clears throat> quite deliberately, digital media solutions is one of our highest, higher margin solutions and serving a particular need in, in, in the growth area. And we have, in some cases, really been promoting it, um, uh, you might say in some ways, ahead of our other products. So it is partly, it is um, uh, substituting in some cases. On the operating expenses front, uh, the growth of 17% overall reflects, again, the acquisitions. Uh, if we strip those out, the operating expenses grew essentially in, in line with inflation, and we had a relatively low organic growth in headcount. The combination of strong revenue growth and uh, lower operating expense growth contributed to almost a doubling of our adjusted operating profit, which is uh, you know, regarded as a very important achievement in, in this year to get back to, to 9 million and to be really beginning to exceed now uh, 
the, the performances back in 2019 pre-COVID. And as importantly, the operating margin has now uh, gone into double digits, 12%, as we had already achieved at the half year. And uh, this is really, a, 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 again, another um, hitting a milestone on the journey to being a much more profitable company, which we set out as our medium term goal. On the other hand, uh, we have had to cope with higher interest rates. Um, we have net debt and therefore our finance costs also went up in a year, a combination uh, by 700,000 uh, to 1.3 million. And that's a combination of higher debt uh, to finance the acquisitions and also of um, mostly higher interest rates um, that we're having to cope with. But non notwithstanding that, our adjusted profit before tax still went up 95 percent uh, and we achieved uh, uh, almost a doubling of our adjusted earnings per share from 2.7p to 5.4p. We have in the uh, statutory accounts a number of highlighted items, uh, in particular the largest of which is a uh, uh, results from the, the way that uh, we have to account for the acquisition of digital decisions as a profit and loss charge because the owners had to stay employed all the way through to the end of the earn-out period. And that is a nearly £8 million accrual, reflecting the success of that company uh, since we bought it. We've also got uh, uh, amortization charges for purchased assets, which we, uh, in common our, our normal accounting practice, and some one-off items such as uh, acquisition costs uh, and also owner's leases um, the, due to having um, closed down parts of our office in London and uh, also looking to sublet our office in New York. Moving on to the balance sheet, and the broad picture there is growth of the whole balance sheet, thanks to the acquisitions and the equity that we raised to finance them. Uh, within the balance sheet, we've got obviously goodwill has increased um, and also networking capital. And that's partly, again, a factor of our of the acquisition themselves, bringing in higher, in total, more debtors and, and, uh, than liabilities, but also a phasing issue as some of those, uh, particularly in America, the uh, companies we acquired had company, uh, customers with quite long payment periods that are imposed on us. So, so that has somewhat increased our debtor day uh, numbers from 61 to 67 days, as well as the fact that we we're inviting quite a lot towards the end of the year. Digital Decisions is now uh, fully, uh, so the earn out for Digital Decisions is now fully provided in the balance sheet. We estimate that will be 15.8 million pounds. It will be paid sometime. Uh, towards the end of May. And uh, as I've said already, we'll, we'll talk further about digital decisions uh, and how it's contributed to our business, but it reflects the great success of that business. We also have some deferred consideration now on the balance sheet for MMI, which will be payable in 2025. And we paid a small amount, uh, a final part of the deferred consideration was paid to Canada that uh, we paid in January. Our net debt has, um, as a result of uh, uh, all that, gone up by uh, maybe just over £4 million to £9.1 million. Um, that comprises £12.4 million cash and £21.5 million bank loan. We have net cash dotted around our business uh, as, a company, as a company. We have operations in many parts of the world and they each need to keep cash for their operations. And how we get to that cash is... Um, that we had a cash inflow um, from operations, including highlighted items of 3.8 million. So that's after paying out a number of the charges I mentioned earlier as part of the acquisition costs. Um, and that uh, also includes a, a networking capital outflow of 6 million. And as I mentioned, some of that is a phasing issue. Some of that is the, nature, the, the makeup of the assets and liabilities that we acquired um, from the, in the companies we bought. And on the, so the net cash generation from operating activities was 1.2 million. Um, we had uh, then 17.5 million invested in the three companies uh, that was funded, largely funded by the proceeds of the share issue and a drawdown of bank borrowings of 3.5 million. And that resulted in a net uh, decrease in our net uh, banking cash of 1.3 million. We, excuse me, uh, a key measure for us, though, uh, having looked at cash, including the highest items, is actually to strip those out and to look at our what we call adjusted cash generated from operations. So that's matching our cash flow against the adjusted 
operating profit, which is the in fact the underlying day-to-day performance of the business. And that ratio is still healthy at 67%. So we're converting two-thirds of our operating profit into cash. It's lower than last year, which is which was abnormal, where we had a very substantial working capital inflow for one-off reasons. Um, but it's a li- little below where we'd probably like to target to be 80-90% most years. Uh, but we will expect that to improve next year as we get through um, some of the working capital reverses. And just to give you a background on the net debt situation, um, we have a a facility which we um, extended, or increased and extended to cover the acquisitions last March, um, which we have available until March 2025, potentially for a further two years. The total facility is 30 million pounds, um, we have drawn down at the year end 21.5 million, leaving undrawn facilities 8.5 million. And we are uh, applying well within the covenants that have applied since that facility was um, put in place, um, which are uh, on interest cover, adjusted leverage, and adjusted for consideration level. And we're, we're trading well within those covenants, and we expect to remain so. So one of the things that we've done this year differently from uh, previously is to change our segmental analysis uh, really to reflect, better reflect the group management structure. uh, And that is to change it from what had previously been uh, a a service line approach of media and analytics and tech. And we now are uh, showing how our group operates from a geographical perspective. And I think that, that really helps us to explain the performance much better as well. So in terms of those geographies, we have UK and Ireland, uh, which includes our international um, unit specializing in international media and also our uh, marketing effectiveness teams, uh, continental Europe, North America and APAC. And in continental Europe, we now include MMI, uh, sorry, I think about Media Path, the business that was headquartered in Sweden, and North America includes MMI, the business we bought in America and Canada. So continental Europe, uh, uh, sorry, the fastest growing area, I was going to say, North America, uh, more than doubled, including the acquisition, but also had very strong organic growth of 73%, uh, really reflecting the plans we already had in place and those being delivered to improve our, our sales in that market. Uh, continental Europe had a respectable organic growth of 6%, um, in, or 26%, including the new path. And the UK, um, which is our largest, still remains our largest uh, unit, um, Mixed in the sense that domestic business uh, was up 6%, um, but that was you know, uh, offset by a reduction in the international project business, um, which went down by 30%, largely reflecting, um, as I'll explain further, a drop in uh, media uh, agency selection activity, overall 3% reduction. But it's still, you know, we're still very much the market leader in the UK, so it's, uh, it's not the area we expect as much growth from. Finally, APAC, still relatively small, um, but doing very well, growing by 18%, all organic, and um, that's particularly in China and Southeast Asia. If we look at our business, uh, and we're going to, in the segmental analysis, now we're publishing profit by geography, but we're also providing a secondary analysis, continuing to explain our services in um, what are currently five service lines, and those are the, the largest of which is media performance. So that's the core business of um, where we're doing benchmarking, saving, tracking, explaining to clients how their agency has been performing. And that uh, includes mostly MMI media parties, including that, and that grew by 33%, including those two, and also includes digital media solutions, which grew by 76%. And media management, as I've just mentioned, saw a small reduction in activity mainly because there are fewer agency pitches in the marketplace for us to be advising on in 2022. Contract compliance, as Nick has already mentioned, grew very strongly by 25%. Uh, and marketing effectiveness, which is the business that helps really to model, help clients decide how they should allocate their media spend, modeling it against things like their sales uh, potential and delivery. Um, static, partly because we've deliberately been trying to focus on, 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 on improving our margins and only really Doing work with the clients who are prepared to pay the kind of you know the fees that we believe re- reflect the value of that activity. Tech advisory is very small and will be folded next year into media management. 
looking at how our profitability um, changed in the year, as you know, overall, I've just mentioned, we doubled our adjusted operating profit uh, and uh, cont contributions from really uh, from the whole world outside of the UK and Ireland. The UK and Ireland stayed relatively static. Um, whereas in Europe, again, we saw operating profit up 63%, reflecting media path acquisition, but also importantly, the margin going up, affecting the fact that media path is a higher margin business. And also that we had increased profitability in a number of European markets, reflecting strong sales in those markets, strong revenue growth in those markets. And uh, in particular, France uh, did very well. And that takes a margin in continental Europe to 30%, which is really now the, the, lower, the highest in the business. In North America, really important this year was a turnaround, which we were planning to achieve in any case organically, but the acquisition of MI in Canada really boosted that and switched us from having been loss making and uh, historically having had problems in, in, in North America to business which is now profitable and which is well placed with uh, to achieve further scale benefits and further growth in that operating profit uh, margin. In APAC continued to be a good performer. It's uh, uptick of 3%, really reflecting revenue growth and, and a shift to, to really trying to drive again towards higher value clients. So I hope that's given a picture of our financial performance and coming back to Nick to take you through our strategy and, and more details of how we, of what we did in the year. Integration progress and contribution of the acquisitions that we made uh, during the course of last year. And as I mentioned, we made two strategic acquisitions. Um, we'll start with the first one, Media Management Inc. in the United States of America. <clears throat> We also made that small tactical acquisition of Ford and Semple in Canada, but we'll focus on, on the US one. Um, as Alan mentioned, it's really, really boosted our business there with uh, revenue growth of over 138%, but also worth noting a strong organic uh, performance from the business. Now, uh, bringing MMI into the organization has almost doubled our client roster with now over 100 clients. That gives us, um, I would say, great stability, a great platform. Um, from which to build uh, our business further. Um, importantly, uh, it, it's helped us penetrate some of the largest advertisers more effectively. So we now work with 19 of the top 25 advertisers and have a really good, um, strong roster of those advertisers spending $100 million or more. Um, we've been able to cross-sell successfully. MMI's service offering um, was highly complementary to Ubiquities. Um, they have a, a product, a highly automated product through proprietary technology called Circle Audit to service the re regional television market, which is, uh, is huge, $40 billion, and it's the only uh, product in the market that addresses that. So that's enabled us to cross-sell um, existing Ubiquity clients into the MMI service offering and, uh, and, and cross-sell back the other way. Um, one of the areas we've made success in, in cross-selling is the digital media solutions with very, very strong revenue growth there. Um, and we're also happy to be able to tell you that we've made good progress capturing the revenue synergies and those which we'd targeted um, during the course of 2022 have been exceeded. Um, that's been primarily, I would say, driven by eliminating third-party data acquisition costs, being able to um, eliminate uh, one of two contracts and renegotiate. We've also um, eliminated one or two duplicate roles, not uh, not significant number of redundancies, but one or two duplicate roles that aren't needed. Um, and through better resource uh, utilization, have um, avoided hiring some roles that we might otherwise have had to have done as ubiquity. So good progress there. Um, and referring back to the cross-selling uh, from uh, clients uh, across our service proposition. Um, we've made very good progress there by, uh, with um, the number of clients buying two or more products up 85% year on year. Um, and that broader service offering that I referenced there has enabled us um, to develop more of a competitive advantage, I would say, um, really contributing well to new business um, successes and the expansion of existing client relationships. So we're very um, uh, happy with the acquisition of MMI and comfortable with the progress that we've made. Um, Media Path Network, Alan referenced, headquartered out of Sweden, uh, really a globally distributed business. 
um, that used to compete directly with Ubiquiti. So the service offering was very, very similar to Ubiquiti's, but delivered in a very different way. It was delivered through the unique technology platform called GMP365. Um, and that was the strategic rationale for acquiring uh, MediaPath, this high quality, high functional um, data management platform that will allow us to analyze uh, all this client's advertising data in a much more automated fashion. So Suzanne uh, Elias, who founded the business and led MediaPath, she's joined our executive leadership team as the chief delivery officer, um, really to drive the change of the delivery of our service onto uh, that technology platform. Now that's a major program um, that we feel will take three years to roll out. The reason being uh, GMP365 has a high level functionality. It takes time for people to be trained on it and to learn it. Um, it also, we need to uh, recognize, means we'll be, as I said, delivering our services in a different way from that which clients have been used to. So we need to engage with our clients and explain to them the changes um, that we're making. And of course, the media agencies are an important stakeholder in our business, and we need to engage with them, explain what we're doing, and help them use the platform as well. We have made good progress on boarding major international clients, some of which are, are, are listed there. Um, and it's also contributed very significantly to some new business wins. Um, pleasingly, those new business wins are geographically distributed. So uh, a couple of major clients in the United States, Centauri in Asia Pacific and Kierke across 11 markets in Europe, in addition to uh, um, a range of national advertisers. So I think we're making good progress in uh, transitioning our business to GMP365, but it is um, a long program, um, which we think will take three years uh, to complete. We are um, noticing on certain projects significant time savings, which as I said, was really the rationale for bringing um, this business in and transferring our business onto GMP365. So up to 60% time saving has been identified on some projects. <clears throat> To update you on our progress against strategy, just a very quick reminder of um, what we're in business to do. We help brand owners increase returns from their media investments and so improve business performance. And we have four central strategic objectives um, to achieve. Um, the first of which is to increase revenue from digital services through the development of productized data solutions. <clears throat> Uh, then we wish to develop high value strategic relationships with more major customers. We're in this fantastic position of having a, a wonderful roster of blue chip clients. We talk about working with over 70 of the world's top 100 advertisers. Um, we're currently generating revenue from 75 of those, um, but there's a lot of growth opportunity with many of them. So we want to strategically develop those. A big focus on improving operational efficiency. Um, as Alan talked us through the numbers, we've um, almost doubled the uh, doubled the margin, so we're making progress there. But there's uh, there's more that we can do, and we're heavily focused on that. And then we are, as you've seen, um, uh, our revenue is skewed geographically to the UK, Ireland, and continental Europe. So we have quite a focus on strengthening our business and growing our business in North America and Asia Pacific. Um, the context of the market we operate in is, is highly dynamic and increases in complexity. I think the starting point is to say that perhaps the advertising market remained more resilient around the world than had been anticipated as macroeconomic challenges started really to, to, to be felt um, probably from about the half year mark onwards. But the, the global advertising market in totality held up well, albeit some pockets of it were very, very significantly uh, challenged. Um, geographically, the most challenging market was China, and that was really down to the zero COVID policy, which you'll all be aware stayed in place for much longer, um, which definitely dampened down economic activity and frankly made it much harder for our people to run the business and, and, uh, and generate business whilst they were uh, effectively trapped in their apartments for long periods of time. Um, we also saw a, a reduced amount of activity in agency selection work, which Alan referenced um, explaining uh, the media management service line uh, performance. If we think back chronologically, uh, that segment was hit most uh, hard or very heavily, I should say, during 2020 in the COVID years. Uh, advertisers had other things to worry about than putting their business up for pitch. That then released pent up demand in 21. So I would say that was a surge year and 22 probably returned to much more 
normalized levels of activity. We have seen, I think, um, the most significant shifts in the digital market for quite some time with Alphabet and Meta coming under pressure for the first time that I can recall. Um, Twitter, obviously the upheaval there um, resulted in a lot of self-inflicted wounds, but we've seen significant gains from TikTok, Amazon building a $10 billion plus advertising business, Apple on the route to building a $10 billion plus advertising business as well. So very, very significant changes in the digital market. Now, two really interesting trends that I wouldn't say they've come out of nowhere, but they really exploded in 2022 was the boom in commerce media. Um, retailers have looked to Amazon and understood the value to their businesses by monetizing their digital real estate and the audiences that come onto their websites. So there's a very concerted effort to develop advertising businesses in the, in the retail media space. Um, there's quite a lot of commentary around it, suggesting this is the third wave of digital advertising and has the potential to be the biggest of them all. We're seeing open web programmatic budgets flow into retail, um, uh, into retail media, and we're seeing search budgets flow into there and uh, trade budgets that historically been going to buy shelf space. So very exciting space there. Um, the most, uh, the, the quickest growing segment, um, though is advanced television, albeit smaller, commerce media is around about $45 billion market in the US now. Advanced television about $25 billion, but is growing the quickest. I think there are challenges there for advertising, audience, uh, for advertisers rather, audience measurement is poor and campaign controls are weak. So all of this creates a lot of complexity for advertisers um, and therefore demand for ubiquity services that we are able to help advertisers navigate these challenges. At the end of 2020, or rather at uh, our, our 2020 results in March, we presented um, a set of operating metrics with the baseline as of the end of 2020. Um, and I'm pleased to, to show you that we're making very good progress against each of these operating uh, metrics. So in our, our bid to cross sell more services and develop higher strategic relationships with clients, we are now um, selling two or more service lines to 97 clients as the end of 2022. Um, the development of the digital media solutions is progressing well uh, with a number of clients buying those almost doubled year on year to 55 now. Now we talk here about the volume of digital advertising and the value of digital advertising analyzed within our media data vault. We've now got 1.4 trillion impressions and over 6.5, 6.6 billion dollars of advertising uh, in the media data vault, uh, which we have analyzed. Um, now that provides us with an incredibly rich and deep uh, uh, data set from which we are uh, able to provide an incredibly robust analysis, um, the most robust analysis of any, any ind independent player of uh, digital marketing activities. Um, and I also feel, feel this represents a, um, quite a, an increasingly deep moat now. If another player wanted to take the same approach, they've got a long way to catch up. It would be difficult for them to compete head on credibly against us when we've got this particular um, depth of data uh, in this specific area, I think. Now, the number of countries served with digital solutions or the new portfolio, uh, this was important um, as the premise was that we would be able to service uh, clients or analyze clients data wherever they um, uh, operated in the world. So if we look at those uh, top 100 advertisers of which we're now serving 75, um, they advertise in a huge number of markets and um, whilst 80% of their spend may go in the um, major economies and the major advertising markets, 20% of their spend in a long tail of markets still represents a large amount of money. So we're demonstrating our ability to uh, service the world's largest advertisers wherever they may operate, now analysing data for them in 91 countries around the world. Now that's probably reaching a uh, saturation point and uh, there may not be much great benefit in uh, tracking this metric going forward, so that might be a metric that we retire. I don't think there's a great difference between servicing clients in 91 markets versus 105, for example. The final metric we look at there is the percentage of revenue we derive from digital services, which has now moved up to 32% to off a base of 25% when we started reporting these metrics. Now, it might seem that um, moving up three percentage points year on year to 32% uh, isn't particularly dramatic, 
But the uh, context to that is that the two major acquisitions we brought in of MMI and MediaPath, their business models are quite heavily skewed towards the broadcast market as well. So the fact that we're continuing to progress um, the, the ratio of revenue delivered from digital services in the context of those two acquisitions, I think, is a positive and we can be satisfied with that. Turning um, to those digital media solutions now, then, it, it is fair to say that has transformed our digital capabilities. I think um, a couple of years ago, we, we didn't have a, a, um, a confident uh, digital product in market, but you can see the rate of growth that this is um, uh, this is moving out and being taken up by clients. So has delivered 76% uh, organic growth. And we continue to run that with a very strong profit margin, uh, somewhat over 50%. We have seven of these productized digital solutions in market. Increasingly, when it, we're, we're centering them on uh, what we call the digital governance program and selling the other uh, solutions more on a, a modular basis. So rather than selling them on a standalone basis, they're increasingly sold as add-ons, if you like, to the digital governance program. One of these uh, new solutions we call Responsible Media Investment. Um, there's an enormous focus, as, as you're all aware, on big corporates and their uh, uh, social responsibility and their ESG strategies. Um, we're now able to advise um, these big advertisers where their media dollars are going in terms of whether they are inadvertently uh, uh, funding bad actors, such as websites that promote hate speech or disinformation, conspiracy theories, uh, anti-vax theories, um, and various other um, uh, dynamics like that. We've now expanded that to 13 markets. It is different in each market because the context of each market is slightly different, but the principle remains the same. We help advertisers uh, identify if they are inadvertently funding bad actors. Um, a new uh, element to that is Scope 3 data. We have partnered with an organization called Scope 3, which launched, uh, uh, I believe it was in January of 2022. They are the, uh, uh, the measurement provider for the carbon carbon footprint or carbon emissions of every aspect of the digital supply chain. So they have a, a CO2 or equivalent emissions um, uh, data point for every impression in the advertising, digital advertising supply chain. And we match our clients' uh, digital activity to Scope 3's data to um, uh, quantify the carbon uh, or carbon CO2 emissions equivalent for our advertisers' digital supply chain. Now, I think that's hopefully uh, um, going to be seen as a valuable um, uh, service for big corporates as they are increasingly required to report um, their scope three uh, emissions. I referenced earlier the um, growth, the speed of growth in the advanced television market in the United States. We have a pilot um, product in, uh, in market there and we'll be able to look at our first um, uh, analysis of that in April of this year. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. In terms of new product development, we are focused on uh, uh, getting a, a retail media solution in market to capture uh, um, that particularly large segment. We're seeking to evolve our paid search product through enhanced automation, and we're looking at influencer marketing. Um, our, our national uh, teams in China and Singapore and Italy have developed their own approach to influencer marketing. So we're having a look at that and uh, seeing the, uh, the relevance, if you like, or validity of rolling that out on a wider geographic basis. So plenty of activity of new product development. If we look to um, the second element of the strategy, developing high value strategic clients, um, I've referenced already that we work 70 of the 75 of the world's top 100 advertisers. Um, we also um, mustn't forget we have a, an extremely strong breadth of national advertisers um, working with around about uh, a total of 600 clients um, around the world. Um, 97 of our total clients are buying two or more service lines, which is progress up 28% year on year. Um, we remain very competitive with the world's largest brand owners, winning uh, important global agency selection mandates. Um, now, this is important not just for the work that that provides, but for the downstream work uh, that follows in terms of um, performance tracking, performance benchmarking, marketing effectiveness opportunities and contract compliance opportunities. And although we work with such a, a high number of the world's leading advertisers, we're still able to penetrate new logos, new advertisers with some uh, promising new business wins. So uh, I believe we are competitive in the market. 
Um, the third um, focus is, uh, of, of the strategy is creating a more efficient business. Margin has proved, improved significantly. Um, and that's been uh, delivered by a contribution of factors, one of which is uh, reduction of uh, production costs. Um, I referenced the elimination of uh, third-party data contracts. That's contributed to that, as has starting to do a little bit more work on the GMP365 platform and reduce uh, outsourcing in markets where we don't have our own on the ground expertise. So that's been very helpful. The digital media solutions, which is growing strongly, um, operate at a very high margin. So we have an improving revenue mix there as well. You saw from Alan's geographic segmentation analysis that historically we were losing money in the United States. So. Uh, the acquisition of MMI has enabled us to scale the business and gain economies of scale, turning us to profit. Um, we are capturing these cost synergies that's in, on track. Um, we have uh, operated for a number of years now um, a media operations center, primarily located in Madrid, but now developing in Guatemala to better service the United States time zone with some resources in India and Indonesia. And through the acquisition of MediaPath, a center in Sofia, Bulgaria as well. So we're able to transfer more um, repetitive work from the higher cost centers into the media operations center. Um, we're taking uh, that uh, concept and uh, utilizing the GMP365 platform as our service delivery model to uh, effectively globalize um, the nature of the media operations center. So um, a focus on utilizing technology to improve efficiencies. Um, the fourth element of the strategic focus is geography. We've referenced um, the growth in North America. That acquisition of MMI has um, not only increased the penetration of large US corporates, but it's improved our visibility within the market as well. Um, Asia Pacific is our fastest growing region organically, up 18%. And despite the challenges of uh, the zero COVID policy in China, that's a, that's a good performance of 11% organic growth. Um, I'll reference extremely strong performance in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, now, our Singapore business unit uh, revenue is up 80%. That has been driven by a combination of things. Um, regional new business wins headquartered out of Singapore. A lot of Asia Pacific uh, um, regional clients are headquartered in Singapore. So winning those mandates has boosted the Singapore margin or Singapore revenue, I should say. But also we're starting now to gain uh, uh, a few more clients from uh, some of the larger growth markets in Southeast Asia, such as uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Continental European growth has been boosted by um, Media Path, but there is also very strong organic growth in um, a number of our markets with a particular standout performance from France with revenue up 46%, but it uh, is also worth referencing good performances in Spain and Italy. Media performance is our largest service line and contributed very strong revenue growth, largely reflecting the acquisitions and the faster growing digital services. I've referenced already the contract compliance service line being our largest or fastest organic line. Um, and Alan mentioned tech advisory services being folded into media management. You'll have seen on the segmentation analysis that tech advisory is a, 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 small, um, a small portion of our revenue. And I don't feel it really makes sense to have that as a standalone service line. We will continue to offer those services and it's important for us to have that capability. Clients do uh, uh, look for us to provide that. Um, but we'll fold that into media management and I think that will um, give us a little bit more of a streamlined um, approach. Um, that will be uh, um, uh, coupled, if you like, with the disposal of a small uh, business unit in Australia, uh, Digital Balance, which um, the, the service that offer, offers is really to um, help advertisers optimise the uh, customer journey on their website. So it doesn't really fit in with the rest of the ubiquity business. So there's a little bit of tidying up of our uh, service proposition and that disposal will be announced shortly or the completion of that. Um, as we sit here now uh, at the start of April, um, uh, I think we can um, be comfortable that 2023 has started on track. We're, we're satisfied where we are in terms of the first quarter. And as we look forward, the pipeline visibility is good. Our strategy is on plan and we continue um, to progress. We are delivering the synergy benefits to our three-year targets. We do need to be cognizant of um, inflationary pressures in the macro environment. Um, in October of last year, we made one-off cost of living relief payments 
to a range of our lower paid members of staff. There is upward pressure on salaries and um, we will see how that progresses through the year, but we do remain confident in delivering our medium term margin growth. We also feel that the complexity and dynamism of the global media market continues to offer ubiquity, uh, up, um, com- continues to offer opportunities for ubiquity. So we feel we are well placed to meet advertiser needs. Now that um, concludes the presentation. That's the slide um, slides that we have. So we'll take any questions now. And Alex, perhaps you would take the slide deck down from screen. Uh, great. That's great, Nick. Alan, thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. And if I may, I will now bring your cameras back up. Um, Nick, did you want me to take down the slides? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. I think we should do that and we'll, uh, we'll take right. some questions that uh, yeah. I see some, are, some are posted already. So I'll... I'll um, uh, read out and moderate the questions. I'll take some myself and uh, I'll ask Alan to take some as well. So the first one, uh, given more than a 1.4 trillion digital media impressions available, does Ubiquity offer or envisage offering any AI enhanced services to the customer base to enhance margin and differentiate the offering still further? Is this possible? That's a very, very good question. It is something we have been considering for a little while now, the application of um, either AI or machine learning or indeed both. I would say we're still at the very early stages of figuring that out. But yes, that is very much uh, our view that we uh, would like to find ways of um, harnessing AI and or machine learning um, to, as you say, enhance the service offering and improve our, our, our business. So that's something that's very early stage though. Um, and I couldn't commit to when we might be able to bring something to market in that respect. Uh, Ubiquity claim, we are a world leader in media investment analysis amongst our 500 media specialists. How many chartered financial analysts do we employ? I'm going to have to pass that question to Alan. I think that question, uh, or the answer is none, but I think that question is probably a slight misunderstanding of what we mean by investment analysis. We are not um, investment analysts in the sense of uh, a financial um, house would be or would need to have CFAs, we are our specialists are specialists in media investment analysis, i.e., they know how to analyze and understand what is actually happening in terms of purchasing of media. Um, so so we don't we wouldn't need to have any CFAs. Um thanks, Alan. Historically, Ubiquity has purchased companies and made deferred payments to sellers remaining with the business. Our record, particularly in the USA, has been bad with some sellers walking away when the payments have been paid and the business profitability is plunging. What are we doing to prevent this happening again? Uh, That's a very good question. I can't um, reference historical acquisitions. I I joined the company two and a half years ago, so I'm not familiar with the details of those, but clearly I can talk to the steps we've taken with the acquisitions we have made in the last couple of years. Let's start with uh, digital decisions where the deferred um, consideration will be paid out during the course of the next few months. Um, I think the first point to note there is a considerable portion of the deferred um, consideration is paid in ubiquity shares. So it remains in the interests of um, the partners of that business to ensure the ongoing strength of the organization. But I'd also point to the fact that the three partners, the largest of which was Ruben Schreier's, he's the chief product officer of our organization and part of the uh, uh, ubiquity leadership team. He has a central role in the company. And uh, I think he recognizes um, the value uh, that he brings to the organization and and that we um, uh, regard him. Uh, One of the other partners, Lars Nordevier, um, has taken on a newly created role as of the start of this year. He becomes our chief data and technology officer and he joins the leadership team as well. And the third partner, a chap called Pete Hanford, has taken uh, another senior and central uh, role in the group as our Um, Group Director of Growth and Revenue. So I think those guys are uh, in a reasonably good place. They're they're motivated and they're happy and they know they've got a central part in the company. If we look to the US, uh, the acquisition of MMI, um, those businesses or or Ubiquity and MMI have been well integrated. We now have merged the management teams operating under one structure. Um, the, uh, the, The principal of that business, Thomas Bridge, 
his deferred consideration um, is for one times the combined operating profit of the group um, in 2024. So he'll be with us, um, um, or he, he has interest in the business um, through to the end of 2024. Um, but as I said, we've now merged and integrated the management teams there. So uh, I feel confident we have stability with that business. Looking at MediaPath, um, Suzanne, as I referenced earlier, uh, earlier the principal and, and largest shareholder in that business has joined the leadership team uh, as well. Um, she doesn't have any deferred consideration. She re received all her consideration up front, but a, a significant proportion of that um, from memory, 20, uh, 20%, 25% 20 of her consideration is in Ubiquity stock, uh, locked in through to the end of 2024, and then with orderly market um, requirements placed on her after that. But uh, Suzanne has joined the executive leadership team. She has a newly created post of chief delivery officer. Um, and uh, uh, I've got to say, she couldn't be working uh, any harder and more enthusiastically to make that um, a success. She's really, really committed to the joint vision uh, um, that we shared through that particular acquisition. So clearly, um, you can never guarantee what's going to happen, but I think we're in a good place with all of those. Um, and certainly we feel uh, we have the ability to manage um, uh, any situation with these regards. Uh, next question, I might have skimmed up a little bit too high. Uh, should I deal with this one? Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is Edison made a mistake last year and published something which um, it slipped out. Uh, it shouldn't have been there saying there was going to be a dividend. So, yeah. Uh, fair, fair comment that they shouldn't have been said. Uh, going to the principle of dividends, um, I mean, clearly we've been through a period of rebuilding the business in 2020 or in 2019 20, and we have also undertaken a number of recent acquisitions. So, uh, our current view is it would not be in the business interest of shareholders to be paying cash out as dividends. We are uh, investing that money that we're generating in the business, and we think that is what's generating uh, good returns or better returns for our shareholders. But we review and keep, you know, every year look at whether or not we should reinstate dividends, but there isn't a current plan at this moment. So, Alan, I think the next one's probably for you as well. Yeah. Um, worth just saying that the, the guys on the call, the investors on the call can't see these questions, so you might need to just read them out. Oh, I beg your pardon, sorry. I, my, so the, sorry, in which case the question before was the question about why Edison had said there was going to be a dividend payment in 2022, and evidently there wasn't. Um, no, that was a mistake on their part, or joint mistake. Um, and the question was also about dividend policy, which I've answered. This question, uh, uh, someone's asked whether um, well, they've worked backwards to work out what the contribution of digital decisions um, was to our business in terms of profit in 22, uh, in 21, and what was it in 22. So the £6.5 million pounds of revenue, which we've declared for, so not, it's not actually directly digital decisions, it's for the digital media solutions business within the group um, and uh, we were asked what was the profit on that and that was uh, in 22 was 3.6 million pounds uh, and you can work that out backwards by uh, knowing that the 15.8 is basically six times the average profit for the two years less what we paid originally for the business um, so hopefully that's that answers that question the other question was would all these contributions be under media services, not actually media services, it's under media performance, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the largest component and is the, the core, well, of course, the wrong word, but it's the part of the business that services which track, uh, if you like, the performance of agencies. Um, there was then a question about why did the printed text, the management presentation, not appear on our website? Uh, well, it just didn't. It should have been up. I think if, if it appeared on our website momentarily after the uh, 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 presentation analyst, you know, that was the process point. So uh, I'm not quite sure what the point was that someone, you know, under an obligation to put it on at the same time. Nick, your next question, I suppose. Sure. How well have your media path and MMI acquisitions performed? Have they exceeded your expectations? Well, hopefully, the presentation has given you uh, a reasonably good flavor of how they've performed. Um, we're very happy with the way they've performed. They've certainly uh, performed two expectations. Um, I didn't particularly have in mind uh, a view as to whether they would exceed expectations. Um, I think they're, they're spot on with where we wanted them to be and, and where we expected them to be. 
Can you expand on your responsible media solution and the opportunity for the company? Uh, yes, so the responsible media solution takes third party data. Um, I reference one, scope three data, uh, but we take data from the uh, global disinformation index. Here in the UK, we take data from the City of London Police, which publishes a list of websites guilty of intellectual property theft. In the UK and the US, we uh, take data from uh, a database reflecting minority-owned media. That's been a big thing, particularly in the US, uh, where um, uh, minority owners of media, should we say African-Americans or Hispanic media owners, have uh, felt they're not taking a fair share of advertisers' budgets. Advertisers aren't funding them um, in the same way as they are uh, um, other media owners. Um, so we've been able to match those third party data sources to our clients, um, digital advertising spend and, and match impressions to those third party data sources and identify. Um, if they do have any problems in this area, I think just a couple of things worth re referencing. We we identified that one of our global pharmaceutical companies was inadvertently funding an anti-vax website. Um, and we also identified for, for some of our customers um, this, this concern that they might not be satisfactorily uh, supporting minority and media owners in, in the United States could well have been borne out. Um, we are quantifying, uh, very interestingly, the carbon footprint or carbon equivalent, CO2 equivalent footprint of our advertisers, our clients, digital advertising. We're now able to create, and we have created, a uh, what you could call a CO2 PM. We are, we are calling it that, actually, um, on the sample we found. So we're able to advise clients um, where their worst uh, impressions, uh, sorry, where their worst CO2 emissions are uh, and help advise them how to cut that. One of the factors we found, I mean, I think everybody has understood for quite some time that there are websites out there that are built purely to attract advertising dollars. They have very limited consumer interest, um, uh, perhaps of what we might call clickbait or some, you know, uh, look at what, what these 10 celebrities look like now kind of thing, where those pages get loaded with an awful lot of ads. Now, we say they have very limited consumer value. We've also identified the fact that they are the worst offenders for burning uh, carbon because they load up so many ads. Um, we have identified that around about 15% of uh, our clients' advertising spend goes to these made-for-advertising websites. So if we can help them eliminate that 15% of spend, which we would deem as wasted, completely wasted, um, not only can we help them redirect that back to media, which um, they can get a bit of a return on their investment, but it also can help them uh, fund quality journalism. And of course, quality journalism, as we know, has suffered from uh, um, uh, um, you know, limitations, should we say, on funding. Better journalism attracts more audiences in, which is better for advertisers, but also there's a further benefit, and that as these are the worst, these made for advertising websites are the worst carbon emitting offenders, we can uh, uh, help our, our clients um, do a lot of positive things. Uh, what is the timing of the 15.8 million pounds to digital decisions, and how much do you expect to be fulfilled in shares? Um, I take there's several actual financial questions here, Max Mitchell. I'll take a few. I think yeah. the first one actually was the interest rate on our debt and is it floating? Uh, was the question. Um, the, yes, it is floating. Our, our debt is based on what is now called Sonia, uh, the success of the LIBOR, um, plus a margin. The margin itself varies slightly depending on <clears throat> where we are against the covenant. At the moment, they, we're roughly 3% um, above Sonia, which is rough in total is around seven percent um and obviously if sonia goes down which people think might happen in, later this year then, then our interest rates would go down um the timing of the payment digital decisions the obligation is to pay within or to agree uh formally the amount and and to pay within a certain period after our agm uh some extent in our control that therefore will be sometime in may uh subject to the vendor's right to challenge any numbers um, and uh, the percentage that the vendor has the right to ask us to pay up to uh, a certain amount I think it's actually five million euros in cash um, and we can determine the balance so we will determine that balance in uh, due course once we you know, having regard to our uh, debt capacity and also having regard to the price of shares to whether or not it's you know the extent of dilution that, that would be uh, implied by by using more shares, so uh, I don't really 
I can't really give a specific number at this point. I think, having said that, I think the, the analysts will be giving an estimate when they publish their uh, papers this week. Um, improvement in working capital, the question is, would there be some improvement in working capital expected in 23 um, through a reduction in debt of days? Um, the short answer is yes, although not, as I was alluding to earlier, one of the challenges we have is the businesses we bought, which have both Media Path and MI, do a lot of work for very large American companies and I actually have a problem naming them. People like Procter & Gamble are saying that they expect us to operate 120 day um, terms and uh, similarly other American companies and other clients expecting us, it was asking us to be 150 days. So these big American groups, and it's particularly Americans, do try and impose very, frankly, onerous in my view, credit terms on us. We try our best to say no or to try and get them to reduce them, but we have inherited quite a lot of that. So it's going to be quite hard to have a big shift. Although we do expect, you know, we obviously will we'll continue to keep collecting and working hard to collect. So I'd expect some small uh, improvements in working capital. And clearly, once you establish, even if you've got long credit terms uh, that you are effectively obliged to accept from your customers, once you're on a year on year basis of, a, of the same credit terms, if you like, from year to year, then clearly the working capital doesn't, there won't be an outflow. What happened last year was we were acquiring this business with long credit terms and that hit us a bit. So I expect it to, the short answer is yes, I do expect it to get a bit better in the next uh, year. And then exceptional costs. Our question was, are we expecting any further exceptional costs in 2023? And by their nature, exceptional costs are not things you should plan for, but Clearly, we do certain things we regard as being appropriate to treat as exceptional, highlighted, which I mentioned earlier, that the um, amortization of purchase intangibles will continue to go through as a highlighted item. And the other thing we um, treat as highlighted is our share based payments, which can fluctuate. Um, we're not expecting really, uh, or there may be some restructuring costs this year as a result of our pushing hard to integrate the businesses move you know and automate but we're not expecting large amounts as things stand right now um, on that uh, could you talk about the retail media product introduction well i can't tell you very much at the moment because it's still very much um in the new product development phase we have um an idea we're working that up um uh, that's not yet in beta testing so it's quite early days yet in an ideal world, we would uh, seek to bring to, bring that to market um, probably sometime in the summer. Uh, but it is our focus; that's our, our priority in our NPD at the moment. But um, th there's not much more I can update you on on that. Oops. As the company grows in scale, would it make sense to split the roles of CFO and COO upon Alan's retirement? Yes, uh, that's absolutely what we are doing. Um, we're at the very advanced stage of recruiting a CFO replacement uh, to Alan. We'll hope to be able to announce that uh, imminently. Um, and that individual will just take on the CFO role. Uh, the COO responsibilities for Alan will um, be allocated um, to uh, other members of the management group. As we move more of our business onto the GMP365 technology platform, the nature of our operations um, will change a little bit and there will be different members of the management team responsible uh, uh, for that. So um, that will ha indeed happen. It sounds like you might be looking at further acquisitions in the US and Asia Pacific. What might we expect in the coming year? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and we do look at M&A opportunities through the lens of those four central elements of the strategy, one of which, as you've identified, is accelerating growth in US and Asia Pacific. So uh, if we find appropriate opportunities um, to seek to acquire, um, I think we're, uh, at, um, uh, we're minded to try and bring in the right, the relevant strategic Opportunities, and, and I would like to identify elements that can strengthen our business further in the US and Asia. That's that's very, very true. Uh, that's, that's great. Thank you for that, Nick and Alan. And I think you have addressed all the questions from investors today. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and we will publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But perhaps before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the company, Nick, could I please ask for a few closing comments? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, all of you, for, for watching today. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. 
I hope that's been illuminating and has uh, given you as much information as you would like at this time and a good good background, a uh, good update on, on the company and the progress we're making against our, our strategy. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for your support. Nick and Alan, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you will now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Big PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's meeting. Good morning to you all. Thank you.